I'm going to talk today about developments uh, concerning the Iran deal, formerly known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, since Congress voted on this agreement last September, and how these events are going to affect the next major development in the deal, and that is something called Implementation Day, which is when most sanctions against Iran will be lifted under the deal. Well, there's been quite a few. There was a report in late December that the administration was using NSA to spy on congressmen and Jewish organizations who were trying to defeat the deal. There was an IAEA report on Iran's past nuclear weapons-related activities, uh, an investigation with which Iran reportedly did not fully cooperate. Iran tested two ballistic missiles in violation of what President Obama and Secretary Kerry said was in the agreement when they announced it. Um, last July, and we had some very bizarre revelations to Congressman Mike Pompeo of Kansas on the legal status of the agreement. And this is stuff we've talked about before, but I think we have to go over it. But I first want to briefly talk about the nuclear uh, test in North Korea, which is related to Iran and, and the nuclear deal and the whole situation. Uh, this week, the North Korean government said that they set off an H-bomb of justice. North Korea does not have an H-bomb. Uh, it is significantly beyond their technical capabilities. I make that uh, assessment based on my work uh, following these issues for the U.S. government, for CIA, and the House Intelligence Committee and State, and consultations with colleagues of mine. It's possible that North Korea attempted to test what's called a boosted fission weapon, which would have a, a small uh, fusion uh, uh, reaction in the core to significantly increase the yield of the weapon. That might have increased the yield maybe to 40 or 50 kilotons. This weapon had a yield of about 6 kilotons. It's a difficult weapon, uh, dif difficult development to achieve. If they achieve that, it looks like they failed, but I'm not even sure that they did that. Uh, this uh, weapon had an estimated yield of 6 kilotons. That might be increased a little bit. The 2013 was 8. 2009, one, and 2006 was under one kiloton. In, in my opinion, either the, the boosted fission effort failed or there wasn't a boosted fission weapon, that this is simply a, a, another lie by the North Korean government. After all, this, you might remember that uh, this is a country well known for making far-fetched and fantastic claims, including uh, the father of the dear leader who allegedly once had 11 holes of one in one game of golf. I won't go over some of the other ridiculous things that they've said, but this is something they're known for doing. It's difficult to confirm. I, I might add, we don't know the depth or, or the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the rock strata where this test was conducted. The kiloton yield may be a little higher, maybe a little lower. The North Koreans won't give us details, but uh, I, I'm, I, can, I think I can say with confidence this was not an H-bomb test, and, and I think most experts agree with that. Now, many experts are saying that this was a, a, uh, uh, a game changer, and I would disagree. I think it's very dangerous. It is continuing a very dangerous trend. Uh, it is giving North Korea the capability of making a weapon it will eventually will be able to miniaturize, either to put in a warhead or to use as an electro, uh, ele uh, electronic pulse weapon to target uh, the U.S. or European or Asian uh, electrical systems. It's a very serious development. I wrote about this in the op-ed in National Review in front of you. You can take a look at it. I suspect that there is a clear relationship between the Iran deal and this test. The Obama administration came into office wanting nuclear deals with Iran and North Korea. And I think this may be attempt by the North Koreans to uh, lure the Obama administration to begin nuclear talks so they can get a deal as generous as the one that Iran obtained. So far, the Obama administration has not shown an interest in doing that, as far as we know, but it's something that I think Congress has to watch very carefully. Um, I, I'm, I'm certain that the, the North Koreans think that Iran got a pretty good deal. So I want to talk about some of the specifics on the Iran deal, and I'll answer questions on the North, Kore North Korean deal also. Um, what has Iran's behavior been like since Congress voted on disapproving the Iran deal in September? As you know, uh, the deal survived those votes, and I think Congress, similar to the Obamacare deal, is to, to Obamacare, starting to learn, out, learn what was really in the deal after they voted on the deal. Uh, 
First, let's talk about ballistic missiles. There were two ballistic missile tests by Iran in October and November. One had a range of eight, about 800 miles. The other had a range of about 1,200 miles. We were told by President Obama and Secretary Kerry that for eight years, Iran would abide by UN Security Council resolutions not to test ballistic missiles. Well, Iran immediately rejected that claim, saying they didn't agree to this uh, in the JCPOA. And it turns out that this commitment is not in the deal itself. It is in an annex to a Security Council resolution that approved the deal. So Iran is technically correct that they did not agree in the nuclear deal not to test ballistic missiles, even though the present Secretary Kerry represented otherwise when the deal was announced in July. The Iranians are also claiming that these tests of missiles do not violate Security Council resolutions because they're not designed to carry nuclear warheads. Well, there's no sane arms control expert I know who thinks that there's any purpose for these missiles other than carrying nuclear warheads. They are not being designed to carry monkeys into space or, 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 or uh, other purposes. Th this is the purpose of these missiles. The Security Council gave the Iranians a, a, a slap on the wrist. wrist. You may notice in, in, a, in a related development, uh, Iran fired rockets near a, a U.S. aircraft carrier in, in the Strait of Hormuz on this 26th of December that landed within 1,500 yards of, of, of the carrier. And uh, after these two missile launches and that development, it was heartening to hear on the 20, 29th of December that the administration was going to initiate new sanctions against Iran for the ballistic missile launches. I was stunned by this, and several people called me up and said, what do you think? I said, I'll believe it when I see it, because the administration is never going to do something that will compromise this deal. The Iranians responded by saying that they are going to ratchet up their missile program in response to the newest sanctions. And lo and behold, on the 31st, the administration called the sanctions off. They said they are postponing these sanctions indefinitely because of ongoing military work, uh, diplomatic work. So this is an indication that this deal is more a restriction on American foreign policy than it is on Iran. Because this administration wants this deal so desperately, the Iranians know they have us. If we put any more sanctions on Iran, Iran walks, and President Obama loses his legacy nuclear deal with Iran. This administration is desperate not to let that happen. And this type of development is going to have significant implications for the verification of this agreement and other important implications that I'm going to discuss. On December 2nd, the IAEA issued a report on Iran's past pursuit of nuclear weapons, known in UN lingo as the possible military dimensions of Iran's nuclear program. Now, there's an there's a interesting story behind this that I think you're aware of. Under the investigation of this issue, which I might add, it was represented as part of the nuclear deal, but we found out later the provisions to conduct the investigation to investigate this issue were, con were actually um, memorialized in secret side agreements between Iran and the IAEA, discovered by Senator Tom Cotton and Congressman Mike Pompeo when they went to the IAEA and were told about these agreements by accident. Under these secret side agreements, the Iranians inspected themselves for evidence of past nuclear weapons related work. This was probably the most, the, the, the most important issue that was discussed during the debate in September by Republican congressmen, and it's why the House did not actually conduct a vote on disapproving the deal. According to the Corker Carbon Bill, the administration was supposed to provide all information about the JCPOA, JCPOA, including all side deals, so Congress could review the agreement. These side deals were never provided. There's been talk of, of, of a lawsuit against the president because of this. Um, but I mean, it was considered a significant instance of bad faith by the administration concerning the deal. Well, the IAEA did this investigation. Iranians inspected the Parchin military base in mid-September, where uh, Iran is suspected of engaging in explosive testing related to the development of nuclear warheads. And then the IAEA started doing its report. The report was issued on the, on the 2nd of December. The report's findings were very interesting. Even though Iran collected its own samples at Parchin, 
the IE determined that Iran was not being truthful with what happened at Parchin. It found that those samples and satellite imagery proved that what Iran said was going on at that facility is not what really was going on. They said a building at Parchin was being used for chemical storage. The IEA said that isn't true. There were other answers to, to questions posed by the IEA in this investigation that the IEA found were not credible. In many instances, the IEA simply went through the, I mean, Iran went through the motions of answering the IEA's questions. Clearly, the file was not closed on Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons, and the IEA director admitted that in a statement before the, the report was issued. Well, nevertheless, the United States voted with other states to close the file on Iran's past pursuit of nuclear weapons in mid-December, even though the IEA report did not close this file. But don't worry about this because this issue was not actually part of the nuclear deal. The administration said this in November. The Iranians have been claiming this. The administration also made the incredible claim before they knew the outcome of the IEA report that they are going to move behind, be, be, beyond this issue regardless of how the report came out because the U.S. has already come up with its own conclusion on Iran's past pursuit of nuclear weapons. That is, the, the Obama administration has determined it didn't pursue nuclear weapons in the past. There was also a very startling conclusion in this that uh, means a lot to me as a former intelligence officer. It found that nuclear weapons related work by Iran continued until at least 2009. And it said after 2009 there wasn't confirmed information that it continued. Didn't say there wasn't information, said there wasn't confirmed information. Uh, I know one member of Congress who is not satisfied with that response and is asking the IEA for unconfirmed information that Iranian nuclear weapons research continues today, went, continues beyond 2009. I'm concerned that the IEA doesn't have confirmed information of this because when Barack Obama became president in 2009, we stopped sharing this type of information with the IAEA. We weren't, we weren't interested in pursuing it. And we didn't want the IEA to pursue. It has to be looked in carefully by Congress to find out what the real story is. What does the IEA really have on this issue? In 2007, the, national, uh, the intelligence community issued a national intelligence estimate that Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons stopped in 2003. I was on the intelligence committee at the time. This was an incredibly badly written and politicized report. And to have the IAEA basically repudiated was sweet. I was, <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, so that, that was a, a, a pretty significant development. Um, there's a very interesting development concerning the legal status of this, this agreement, which I think is going to make it easier for the next president to throw this agreement out. Mr. Pompeo asked the administration, is this a treaty or is it an executive agreement? Is it binding and who signed it? Uh, the answer is, it is an unsigned binding political commitment. <laughs> now, I don't know, I've been in this town for over 20 years. I don't know what that is. Um, and it was sort of incredible. Now, it, now, we knew no one signed it, but how the administration admit that was interesting. What, but is, it's also interesting to note that although the U.S. Congress, the Senate, was not allowed to perform its duties under the Constitution to ratify what is clearly a treaty, which means a two-thirds vote should have been taken to make this a legally binding uh, a document on the U.S. The Iranian parliament did vote on this agreement. However, it amended the agreement to add other elements, saying that the, one of the purposes of the agreement is to disable the, the Israeli nuclear program. It forbids inspections of military sites, as well as interviews of officers, which I assume means military officers and scientists. It also calls for Iran to expand its defenses, including its missile program. That's Iran's understanding of this agreement. It's not our understanding of the agreement. It's not what President Obama said in the agreement. That's Iran's understanding. That is the Mullah's understanding, the Iranian parliament's understanding. It's a different agreement than what was sold to the American people. It's a very different agreement than Congress voted on in September. And I guess part of the reason here is that we had a vote on the agreement before we knew what was in the agreement. And we're now finding out it's much worse uh, than we thought. And I want to touch on this issue on spying on Congress. And I, I assume my, Dan, my friend Dan Pollack, uh, that the NSA has a special file on him for his opposition to the Iran agreement. Uh, there was a remarkable Wall Street Journal article in, in late December that NSA was collecting information, probably because of its expanded collection against Benjamin Netanyahu concerning um, 
his opposition and efforts to, to uh, derail the nuclear deal with Iran. Many people are offended at that. I'm not as an intelligence officer. You know, nations spy on other nations in the real world. I was never troubled that we were listening into Angela Merkel's cell phone, and I will note that right after the, the, the uproar in Germany over that, it turned out that German intelligence was listening into the cell phones of Secretaries Kerry and Clinton. I mean, this goes on in the real world, and, and let's, and I, and, and I mean, we know the Israelis are spying on the United States. Let's, let's be grown if we know this goes on. However, ca caught up in that collection were private discussions by members of Congress and American Jewish organizations. Now, this happens sometimes in NSA collection. If that happens, the name is minimized, it's removed. And let's say an American citizen will say uh, citizen one, citizen two. And that information is treated very carefully. It's possible for a, a policy official to get the name of the, of, of the American collective. That's, that is done under extraordinary circumstances. Intelligence concerning the discussions of congressmen is extremely sensitive and is supposed to be destroyed unless, unless there is a compelling foreign intelligence reason to keep this information and to disseminate it. The only way to do that is for a waiver by the NSA director according to the NSA's rules. It, it's, and the reason for this is we don't want one branch of government spying on another. We don't want the president to use one of the most powerful intelligence agencies on earth to listen in on the conversations of another branch of government. That, that's what happens in banana republics. That's not supposed to happen in this country. Um, it appears, according to the Wall Street Journal article, that the White House knew it was getting this information, and at least one official said to NSA, we're not telling you to collect it, we're not telling you not to collect it, you decide. Sorry. What they really were saying, we're not telling you to collect this stuff, but if you do collect it, we'd be very grateful. That's what was really going on here. They knew they were not supposed to have this information. And I have some more news that was not in the Wall Street Journal article. Uh, Pete Hoekstra, former Intelligence Committee chairman and a good friend of mine, has heard that the White House was using this information to identify congressmen who they had to lean on to change their position on the Iran deal. Now, this is important because the vote on the Iran deal in Congress was pretty narrow. The president was desperate to get a, a, a veto-proof majority so he would not have to go through the humiliating spectacle of vetoing Congress's rejection of the deal, the Senate's rejection of the deal. The White House may have won this battle because it had NSA reporting on the opponents of this deal, the, the private discussions of opponents of this deal, American opponents of this deal. I think this is truly outrageous. It has to be investigated. The House Intelligence Committee is investigating it. It concerns me there has not been nearly enough press about this because, I mean, th this really is a, a, a very serious violation of, of the way uh, the U.S. government is supposed to operate and the way intelligence is supposed to be used. So the final point I want to talk about um, well, I, I'll mention we know there are a slew of other examples of bad behavior by the Iranians um, since Congress voted on the deal. Their increased role in Syria, firing rockets at U.S. carrier, arresting another American and American green card holder, convicting Washington Post reporter Jason Rosarian of espionage and sentencing him to an indefinite prison sentence. I don't think this shows good faith by the Iranians since we voted on this, uh, voted, since Congress voted on this agreement last September. Nevertheless, we're moving rapidly towards Implementation Day, uh, the day that most sanctions against Iran will be lifted under the JCPOA. To reach that day, Iran has to disable uh, most of its centrifuges, all, I think, but about 5,000 of its, of its uh, 19,000 centrifuges, send its uranium to Russia, most of its enriched uranium to Russia, or dilute it, and reconfigure the Arak uh, heavy water reactor um, which is eventually going to be redesigned, not so it won't produce enriched uranium, uh, not won't produce plutonium, but it will produce less plutonium. And I had some figures here I wanted to talk about on uh, one point here. Now, concerning sending the, the, the nation's enriched uranium to Russia, there are some outstanding questions on what Iran really did. Secretary Kerry said that the Iranians sent 25,000 pounds of enriched uranium. The IEA says that Iran has 27,000 pounds. The Iranians are claiming they sent about 17,000 pounds. 
So there's a, so there's a disparity between these numbers that has to be resolved. But even more in, important, this was self-reported by Iran. It wasn't reported by the IAEA. Now, the Russians verified the Iranian number, which doesn't give me any confidence that, confidence that it's accurate. But, but I mean, this, this shipment should have been verified by the IAEA. That hasn't happened yet. And I think that raises some questions about what was really transferred. And, and I'm sort of curious why Secretary Kerry is claiming such a larger number than the Iranian government is claiming. Uh, it does look like Iran is disabling and disassembling some centrifuges. They're not being destroyed. They can be set up again. And I haven't heard what's happening with the Arak reactor, but I think it's likely that they will take the steps that were necessary. So the Iranians think implementation day is going to be this month. And, and actually, they were saying last week they thought it would be this week. The, the administration was saying earlier it would be in several months. That's what the IAEA is saying. I think there's going to be questions about uh, Iran's compliance with the various commitments it has to meet to, to get to implementation day. But consider that Iran hasn't been living up to many of the requirements it already agreed to on missile sanctions, uh, on the investigations that pass uh, weapons-related work. And the Obama administration has, uh, according to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, one critic, has been acting as Iran's attorney to explain away its various violations of its previous commitments. So when implementation day comes, when the IAEA probably gives an inconclusive report on whether Iran has abided by these commitments, I have no doubt there'll be another unanimous vote to say that Iran has met these commitments, just like we voted that Iran met its commitments on the investigation of its past weapons-related work. So it's not an encouraging picture. And uh, I think the, the, the efforts to force the administration to take action against this are difficult. I know Senator Cruz is preparing some legislation to withhold some, to withhold some funding from the State Department budget if sanctions are, are um, lifted against Iran. But that legislation is still being worked, so I don't, I don't want to say any more about it. But, and I know there are other congressmen who are, who are preparing legislation to pressure the administration. Uh, it really has to be an issue in the presidential campaign because uh, clearly Iran thinks it is in the driver's seat concerning this deal. Uh, I think this is emboldening Iranian behavior with, throughout the Middle East, and I think it is having an effect on uh, what's happening in the, in the tensions between our Saudi Arabia and Iran, and it's certainly having an effect in Syria and Iraq. So um, I wish I had a more encouraging uh, picture for you, but that's my summary of the situation, and I welcome your questions. Yes, sir. Um, sorry, John. <clears throat> let, me just, let me just ask one question real fast before I open it up. And Fred, let me just say you would not be at the right lunch if you had an encouraging picture. <laughs> so this is how you know you're in the right room. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question, and John, I apologize for interrupting, but um, Fred, the, the point that you made that Iran ha seems to have just a, a wildly different understanding of, of this deal and what this deal says and what it does for them, it seems to go beyond just sort of, you know, the, the standard, you know, disagreements over the definition of something, right, that sometimes characterizes treaty negotiations. How is that not getting more traction than it has gotten in it? I mean, it's maybe an unanswerable kind of question, but just it seems to me that if the Iranians have such a fundamentally different understanding of what this deal even says, I mean, disarming Israel's nuclear program, I mean, how, how, is, how are more members of Congress not all over that? Well, Iran portrayed these as minor changes, and the administration ignored them. Uh, there are members of Congress who have spoken out uh, against this, but I think we need to need more. We need to hear more from the Hill. But it, it's hard to get traction when the administration won't address it at all. They're pretending it didn't happen, and by ignoring these changes, we're emboldening Iran to defy this agreement more. I mean, I th really think we have to hear more about this. Um, Dan, let me let me. Okay, quickly. The, the real problem here now, in my dealings with Congress, has been people's approach to this entire affair is as though this were a past defeat, rather than working productively to stop the deal from going forward. So we need a paradigm change here. People, even on our side, are dealing with it as yet another thing that the Obama administration has screwed up on foreign policy instead of viewing it as an ongoing project that we need to make a difference on in the near term. 
So that's what the call to action is. We need to getting people to, uh, I'm sure you agree. The, 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 the comment uh, for our people watching online is that the problem here is that uh, too many people think this is a past defeat and are not prepared to do something to move forward and do something now. I completely agree. This battle is not over. We have to continue to fight against this terrible deal to change it now or in the future and to not give uh, Iran a blank check uh, to, to, to continue its, its, its behavior, which I think in the, in the Middle East is getting worse and worse. Sir. These are two good questions. Um, how much of this can be reversed, especially by the next president? And uh, is there a, an opportunity for some type of legal relief? Um, I think the next president should tear up this agreement on his or her first day in office. I don't know if you know anyone who's promised to do that. But, <laughs> but that's been my position. I say that at the end of every video and article I write on this. This is a terrible agreement. And I've, I have criticized two presidential candidates for saying they won't do that, because I, I think it's essential that we send a message to Iran and the American people, this deal is a disaster, and the next president is going to chart a new course. And that's really what we have to do. I think with leadership in the White House, we can reverse this entire deal. We can round up our allies to say, you know, I don't know what the Obama administration told you, but this is the way it's going to be with the United States under this administration, and you're going to be with us. And I think with strong leadership, and especially in, in, in terms of Iran's behavior, I think we can sell that to our European allies to say, we have to have another approach. This is not working. With Iran testing missiles, firing rockets near a US aircraft carrier, holding American, uh, Americans uh, prisoner, it's obvious it didn't investigate on it, or it didn't cooperate the investigation of its past nuclear weapons program. I mean, a strong leader can easily make a case that we have to start over. That, that's, that's my position, and I think that we can start over. I might add, Iran is not getting rid of its nuclear infrastructure. It's disabling it, it's putting it aside, it's sending enriched uranium out of the country for an equivalent amount in raw yellow cake from Kazakhstan. So there's, no, there's going to be no change. It's going to set it back maybe five or six months. It'll be able to replace all that enriched uranium fairly quickly. This is not a deal that's, dis, that's disassembling or destroying any of Iran's nuclear infrastructure. That's what really had to be done. In terms of, of legislative relief, I'm just going to talk about this briefly, then I, I want Ben to talk about it, because he's an attorney and he works, with, he works closely with the Hill. I think we simply have to have a decision by the House leadership to move on a lawsuit. Now, I, I agree with you, it's going to be hard to get a court to move on this, and it's going to be time consuming. <laughs> but I still think that, that the lawsuit has to be filed to lay a marker down on how unacceptable Congress finds this deal. And I'm frustrated that no members of Congress have talked about filing this lawsuit, and it hasn't happened. And I don't know what the reason is for that. Well, at, at your invitation, I, uh, usually the, the, um, the comment that I'm a lawyer and I work with folks on the Hill is usually my cue to get something wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and, and go out on a limb. But uh, look, I, I think that a lawsuit could be filed on multiple fronts. I mean, I just think there are so many reasons why a lawsuit would, would survive standing and would actually be successful on the merits. I think it's a question of political will. I think that there's just, there's a certain lawsuit fatigue in some sense that, that's set in on the Hill. Uh, we can go into that more offline if anyone wants to, but that, that's the impression I got. And um, I don't know if anyone else has comments on that, but if not, Bridget, you had a question? Mm -hmm. uh, 
agreement or whatever. I mean, just for an ordinary citizen, you, your sort of reaction is, how can it be described as a deal or an agreement? And why are we speaking in terms of them living up to their commitments if they haven't even signed this? I mean, I, I think the candidates and the Republicans should be speaking to the very obvious fact that we're the only ones on the hook. So why are we living up to any obligations if they haven't even yet signed something committing them? It's a great question. The question is, uh, why is the United States holding itself to this agreement when no one has signed it and the Iranians, it's not binding on the Iranians? And I'll just repeat what Congressman Pompeo was said, was told. This is an unsigned, non-binding political commitment. And, and I agree with you that the presidential candidates have to explore that and ask, I mean, this was certainly rolled out like it was a binding commitment, that it was a major international treaty-like agreement. They never used the word treaty. Uh, I mean, would, would you have all those hoopla for an unsigned, non-binding uh, political commitment, whatever that is? That sounds like something that two low-level diplomats could negotiate in a coffee shop. This is, this is obviously a major agreement that the American people were led to believe was binding, was a major development. Um, and I, I think that uh, trying to explain how that could be the administration's position is, is mind-boggling. I think it shows I mean, in terms of foreign policy, this administration simply isn't serious on so many levels. Um, and I mean, I'll, I think this agreement is, is going to unravel. The Iranians may unravel it for us and save the, administ the administration from itself. But I agree with you. This, this needs to be an issue in the campaign. Other comments? Um, Sam. So, uh, my question, going back to the North Korea test, um, just curious, the six kiloton figure, uh, I think the number I've seen most of the press is 30 kilotons. I haven't seen 30. The New York Times is using six. I have seen some people say it's as high as 15, but most have been six. Uh, but, you know, the jury's out, and experts are going to assess this. The measurement of the kiloton is not, uh, you ha is, a, is a measurement that's, that's found indirectly based on the seismic reading of, of, the, of, the, of the disturbance caused by, by um, uh, by the detonation, the depth affects it, the rock strata affects it. I haven't heard a figure that large. I mean, I, I, it's possible, but I haven't heard that. What was Hiroshima? Hiroshima was 15, Nagasaki was 20, and the first U.S. test was 20, 20 kilotons. Other, Joel, did you have something? A corollary question. From the administration's perspective, what do you you think they think they've accomplished this flawed The question is, what does the administration think it's, it's accomplished with this flawed arrangement with Iran? That is an explosive question, and my experts and uh, my colleagues and I have sharp disagreements on it. Uh, I have colleagues who think that they want, think the administration wanted Iran to be a regional hegemon, thinking that somehow this could bring about stability in the region. Uh, I'm of the school that the administration thinks somehow they can make Iran a partner for peace through this deal. I, I actually think they believe that. I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, I believe there also is a strong possibility that this administration thinks that the Iranian nuclear program is unstoppable and that we can live with a nuclear Iran. So they don't really care if Iran lives with this deal because they don't think the program can be stopped anyway and they don't think nuclear weapons by Iran are a threat. There are some academics who try to draw moral equivalence between the Indian and Pakistani nuclear program and the the Iranian program or the Israeli nuclear program and Iranian nuclear program. The difference is Iran is a state sponsor of terror that wants to wipe another nation off the map. These comparisons don't make any sense. So there's a lot of interpretations. Uh, I'll let you pick the one you agree with. Dan. Just said a word about the relative strength of the United States in our bargaining position today compared to after the implementation. The Iranians have been extremely aggressive and not caring about things like shooting missiles near aircraft carrier now, how will that be after the implementation? The, the, the question is, how will our uh, diplomatic position be, be weakened after implementation day in light of the fact that Iran is setting off missiles and doing all kinds of other things inconsistent with the deal before sanctions lifted against it? And I might add that the Iranian parliament, as I said when they amended the deal, said sanctions can only be permanently lifted, not suspended. Now, we were told, and the agreement says, Sanctions will be suspended, and if Ron doesn't comply, they'll be reinstated.
proposed. And the Iranians said, if you do that, we'll pull out of the deal. I think America's uh, diplomatic leverage has been significantly reduced uh, by our response to these various provocations and examples of, of noncompliance by the Iranian government. And after implementation day, we're going to have substantially less uh, um, leverage. And I don't think there's any chance we're going to do anything to um, endanger this deal by forcing Iran to pull out before Mr. Ba Obama leaves office. He's not going to implement more sanctions on Iran. He wants to leave office with this deal intact. Sir, we're going to make this the last question. Go ahead. There's, the mic's not working today, so just ask your question. Uh, on the uh, shipment of uh, the enriched uranium, I saw that uh, Norway as well as uh, Russia was involved. Now, would it be possible through Norway to get some believable verification? I agree with you. Russian verification is worthless. Uh, the, the question is, if Norway was involved in the shipment of the rich uranium, could we get verification from them? I, I haven't heard that. That would be a, a, a way to go to try to figure out what was involved. Uh, for me, the big question, I mean, I'm concerned that Iran stated itself without IAE verification how much it sent. But I'm also very concerned at the, at the significant disparity between the number that Secretary Kerry laid out and the number the Iranians are laying out. And I don't know what the explanation is for that. Okay. Um, well, I think we will bring this session to a close.